gets a gourd to stay in the Bronx. Good day for a flyby during the Star Spangled Banner. U.S. Navy F-14 Tomcats. Zooming past overhead and down below, the Yankees take the field. The red-hot Yankees, and today led to the field by their starter, Mike Messina, who is 4-0 and in his last four decisions. And let's look at the starting lineup for the New York Mets. They'll lead it off with Joe McEwing, who's been hot. Desi Relaford, it's hard to get him out of the lineup, and he's in the lineup because of an injury suffered last night by Robin Ventura. Edgardo Alfonso is back in the lineup at second base. Mike Piazza, the DH, he homered last night in his first game back from the broken toe one Friday ago. Then it's Mark Johnson in right, Todd Zeal at first, Jay Payton in center. Todd Pratt is batting eighth. He does the catching, and Ray Ordonez hitting 227 batting tonight. The defense for the New York Yankees, not too good. 13th in the American League in fielding percentage, 62 errors as a group. And that's surprising to see Scott Brocious with 17 errors, but Tim McCarver says, ah, don't be fooled into thinking that his skills are slipping over at third base. That's right. He's got a few more errors this year than he had last year uh, for the full year. But Scott Brosh is still considered by many, me included, as one of the fine third basemen in the game. Speaking of one of the finer in the game, Mike Mussina, 9-7, and seven, as Joe said, 4-0 and oh in his last four decisions. And obviously, when you're facing a pitcher, you want to get him into his stretch because that means... You've got guys on base. So wind up yes, stretch no. The numbers on Messina from the stretch are poor. With runners on base, the hitters have a 313 average, and the reason for that, he can't throw the knuckle curve and the knuckle change as effectively as he can from the windup. Why don't you read this today? All right, this broadcast is also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. You might get to do that at the All-Star game. Oh. I can't wait. McEwing, Relaford, and Alfonso in the first inning for the Mets, who, ladies and gentlemen, represented the National League in the World Series last year, and they trail the Montreal Expos in the NL Eastern Division. They're in last place. First pitch of the day is a strike on the outside corner. You look at this Mets lineup, and Bobby Valentine is more than happy these days to write in the name of Joe McEwing. Heck, he's happy to write in Relaford's name. A couple of guys who at least give this Mets lineup some jolt, some sign of life. Animation. Here's the 0-1 from Messina. Ball and a strike. McEwing, since the 1st of June, is hitting 375. He has a nine-game hitting streak. He had a 25-game hitting streak in 99 as a rookie with St. Louis. And that's when the fans in St. Louis fell in love with Super Joe, and he got his nickname. Ball and a strike. Ball and two strikes. Mike Piazza will talk about it during the course of today's game. Trying to fight his way back into the lineup for the Mets. Trying to fight his way back behind the plate tomorrow for the Mets and trying to fight his way into the starting lineup on Tuesday for the National League. Batter number one is out number one. McEwing, goodbye. That's the knuckle curveball from Mike Messina disappearing on Joe McEwing. Ball starting at the knees out of the strike zone. And again, Messina with the windup, needs that high leg kick like that to get the good break on the knuckle curve. While well, some say the knuckle curve is a misnomer, that a lot of pitchers get that index finger out of the way on their curveball anyway, as Relaford stands in, you believe it is appropriately named. I think it is particularly, for, there was another one right there, particularly for Musina because on his knuckle change, he uses his index finger only. For his knuckle curve, he uses both the middle finger and the index finger. That's a knuckle curve ball right here. Nope, fastball. He was being deceptive knowing that you were looking into his That's glove. That's right. A lot of times uh, you can't see whether the fingertips, and I'm protecting myself right, right. now. You can it's tell all shadows. Right. Yes, it is. You can't, it's shadows, and you can't tell whether the fingertips are on the seams or not. 0-2 oh, on Relaford. We'll just save that little experiment for another time. 
One out, nobody on. One ball, two strikes. We did have on the scouting report uh, that he was an east-west pitcher. He is not a low ball pitcher until he throws a knuckle curve. As you see, his road record much better than at home, and that is very unusual, and we'll tell you why. One, two. Goodbye. Two up, two strikeouts. Alfonso walking to the plate. Wicked knuckle curveball again disappearing and Messina bad news for the Mets appears to have great stuff this afternoon When a pitcher is pitching at home He's pitching from the same mound for the most part over an 81 game stretch when he pitches on the road It's a different mound in every ballpark to which he goes So it would stand to reason that your ERA would be better at home than on the road But not with Messina strike one on Alfonso Messina has been ahead of each hitter here in the first inning. He struck out McEwing. He struck out Relaford. Interesting and to note, Joe, that the batter's boxes, for the most part, are uniform in every ballpark. Except for Fenway. Except for Fenway. That's right. <laughs> That's for Carl Everett. That's right. <laughs> Nothing in one with two out, nobody on. That's strike two, and Messina can strike out the side. Here in the first inning, Mike Messina, a five-time All-Star. He will not be going to this year's All-Star game. During the course of the day, we'll tell you the Yankees who aren't going. <laughs> How are you going to start your day, Mike Messina? That's a good start. Here could not have been better his last time out. Sunday night in Atlanta, a two to one victory over the Braves. How will he fare today? And the starting lineup for the New York Yankees. Zapier will face Knobloch, the DH. Jeter batting second. Bernie Williams is hitting third. Tino Martinez red hot. Good for him. Jorge Posada, the catcher. Paul O'Neill's in right. Shane Spencer in left. Brocious and Soriano, the bottom two in the Yankees starting lineup. The defense for the Mets, middle of the pack in the National League. Eighth in fielding percentage. Zeal, eight errors at first. Ordonez, nine errors at short. The outfield, not a very good outfield for the Mets, either defensively or at the plate. They're happy to have Peyton back patrolling center. And Kevin Apier signed a big contract over the offseason. He's five and eight. Joe, this uh, may be nothing, but when Apier was warming up, he had that backward uh, motion with his with his shoulder. He has had shoulder surgery, and uh, that is not a good sign when 1998 was the year. But Kevin has been by far the most effective pitcher for the Mets when he is on. Sometimes uh, a pitcher goes out there, and he simply is not as loose as he was his last outing, and that was last Sunday, as you said. First pitch is outside for a ball to Knobloch, who homered on Monday. First home run in 37 games, and here's the delivery by Apier. Uh, it's a funky motion. He kind of comes out of that ball of, of black and orange. Black shirts the Mets are wearing today. One ball, one strike in the scouting report. Two types of sliders. One that he uses to left-handers and the one to right-handers that goes away from right-handed batters and down to left-handers. 225 career average have right-handers against him, and that's that funky delivery that we were talking about. Very tough to pick up. Balls behind Knobloch, two and one. Tough situation for the Yankees with Knobloch, a publicized proposed trade to Seattle that was scuttled at the last moments. Knobloch knows he was at least on his way out the door until the deal fell apart. He's had a disappointing year at the plate. He's two and two here, leading it off. How about the numbers? April, very good start for Joe Torre's Yankees for Chuck Knobloch, a 333 average. But since then, a 210 average, two of his four home runs, the slugging percentage. Look at the on base percentage for predominantly. The leadoff hitter in this Yankee lineup under 300. Here's a 2-2. And 2-3. Ezzy Relaford. 
instead of Ventura, who injured his right shoulder last night, one out. There's Robin. Robin had surgery on that shoulder the offseason in 99, trying to clean up some debris in his shoulder, and last night he aggravated his right shoulder, and they hope with a day off today, tomorrow, the All-Star break, that he'll be ready to go when baseball resumes play on Thursday. Here's Jeter. Four times an All-Star, and he will join the Yankee group going to Seattle after tomorrow night's game. That's a strike. Of the seven Yankees selected by Joe Torre, Bernie Williams on deck, uh, the biggest question, I think, was Derek Jeter. Miguel Tejada has 18 home runs with the Oakland Athletics. Andy Pettit, last night's winner, will be going to Seattle. Joe Torre simply says, the most a Yankee All-Star since 1962, one more than the Seattle Mariners. So 13 from those two teams. One ball, one strike on Jeter here with one out. To the shortstop, Ordonez to his right, two up. Joe Torre talking about Derek Jeter, saying Derek Jeter's average is about 50 points higher than Miguel Tejada. And Joe Torre not backing up on his selection of seven All-Stars. You can defend any one of the All-Star selections right. by Joe Torre. Individually, mm -hmm. you can say Williams deserves to go. I think you can make a strong case for Mike Stanton, as Kevin Kennedy did in the pregame show today, mm -hmm. as compared to Jeff Nelson. I think the sheer volume, and it's not unprecedented, done by Bobby Cox in 97, by Cito Gaston in 93. It's not crazy to think that the Yankees would take seven and Joe Torre would select seven three pitchers on that list as a breaking ball is in for a strike for the all-star game on Tuesday night three days until the all-star game it says there Tim mm -hmm. getting ready yes <laughs> two out nobody on Owen won the count I'm going to Seattle tonight man you kidding already yes sir Williams takes a strike it's Owen two but I think you're always going to get questions about who the manager selects the number it's a high number Joe Torre obviously knew he was going to get criticism for the number of Yankees that he is bringing he's defended his decisions and as I said you can make a case for any one of the seven ball one floats outside of Bernie Williams I think these days it's been Yankee 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 in the postseason it's been the Yankees you know we show them week after week on the Fox Saturday baseball game of the week and I think you could make a case for some of the other players around the league to get a chance on that Tuesday night in front of a national audience to showcase some of the other young talent in the American League. That to me is the one aspect to it that I think is disappointing. But for Joe Torre you can understand it. How's that for right down the middle and saying nothing for five minutes? <laughs> Well, keep in mind they won the world championship the last four out of five years. So if any edge is going to go to any team, in my view, and that's why I agree with Tory. And if I were the manager in his boots, I would have done the same thing. You would have. Absolutely. I would have. I think the irony of all irony, and that strike three call to end the first inning, is in my opinion, Bobby Valentine did a better job with his selection process than the guy in the other dugout. Mike Piazza with his fractured left big toe walks into the batter's box wearing a protective guard on the top of that left shoe. He leads it off here in the second inning. No score. Messina struck out the side in the first and he blows a fastball over the inside corner for strike one here to start the second. Piazza, Mark Johnson and Todd Zeal. There is that protective guard that Piazza has borrowed from Shinjo, the outfielder for the Mets. He typically wears that. Takes it inside, one ball, one strike. And Piazza, I know we're not going to have time to get into it now, but isn't it refreshing to see a guy do everything he possibly can to be a part of the All-Star game? It is. Piazza has every reason not to go. That's one reason to go. Putting the Mets on the board on a high curveball from Andy Pettit in last night's game. 
But here's a guy who appreciates being there. Here's a guy with a Clemens situation, possibly having to answer those questions again if indeed Clemens is the starting pitcher and Piazza's in the starting lineup. Here's a guy who's got a broken, a fractured left big toe. He hasn't been able to catch for the past week. And he wants to be there. Two balls, two strikes, because he respects and appreciates what it means to be an all-star. Two selections for the Mets. Rick Reed, his second appearance. And Mike Piazza, should he elect to go, it'll be his ninth. But he couldn't go last year because of the concussion received on July 8th from Roger Clemens on the knockdown pitch. The 2-2. Two -two. Piazza into right center field. That ball will get down and go all the way to the wall. Piazza will end up with a double and a good start to the second for the Mets. He hit that ball flat-footed. There's nobody stronger pound for pound. Watch the left foot plant, and he hits the ball flat-footed. To hit a ball that hard, that far, the other way, is just brute strength and coordination. Can there be brute coordination? In his case, yes. <laughs> Running all right. He's never going to, never was a fast runner. A Piazza with an opposite field double. Here's Mark Johnson getting a chance in the starting lineup today. And you might see different guys getting opportunities. Not only those on the active roster for the Mets now, but I'm sure before too long, Alex Escobar will come back up when they're ready to put him in the lineup every day. They're already seemingly at that point in what is a lost season with the Mets. Ball one up and into Johnson who's driven in seven. With runners in scoring position as the Mets have here they have been dreadful. And you have to fight every urge to make this a Let's bring up every negative statistic on the Mets, but it's so surprising that they are playing so poorly. Their average with runners in scoring position. Look at that, 058 in the last eight games. Three runs or less in 46 of their 87 games this season. They've scored the fewest runs in Major League Baseball. Their average as a team is last in the National League. Here's a 2-0 to Johnson. Now it's 3-0 from Messina. For most teams, runners on at second or third and or third is scoring position. For the Mets this season, it's been runners in stranded position. Piazza the runner at second with nobody out. We'll see what they do with Johnson on a 3-0 pitch. Meaning, is he swinging if he likes it? He is, and it's 3-1. That's what you do not want to do is foul it off the other way on a 3-0 pitch. If you're late when you're looking for the fastball, what are you going to be if you're behind in the count? I'm sure that's running through Bobby Ballantyne's mind right now. Three balls and a strike. Good off double by Piazza. And another foul back and out of play on another fastball, and it's three and two. Zeal waits to hit next. Sold out house. Yankee Stadium and they want to see Messina bounce back from a 3-0 count and get his fourth strike out of the game. At least most do. It's still 3-2. That was the knuckle change. You get to where you can read Mussina's pitching. He's a very interesting pitcher from that standpoint. His very strong fingers and is able to throw a pitch like that. Mussina, a two to one winner at Shea on June 16th on a Saturday afternoon. Even had an RBI single in that game, which was the difference on the scoreboard. Again, the 3-2. One out. So not only does Johnson not drive in the run or reach base after going up 3-0, he doesn't advance the runner. The strikeout for the first out. Back on June 16th, Messina was overpowering. 
even good at the plate with a two out RBI single up the middle to put the Yankees on top two to nothing at the time and they won the game two one. They're late they need one more up on right on the wall. Here's Zeal. 60 feet 6 inches away from the pitching rubber is a moose crossing and it's been dangerous for the Mets so far today. <laughs> That's into center field. Piazza will have to hold at third and it's first and third one out. Is Piazza guilty of not knowing where the shortstop was? No, you never know where the shortstop is because he's behind you. You don't know whether he's trickling over. And Piazza looking back, you see him looking back right there. He doesn't know whether Derek Jeter is trying to daylight play. You never know that. Mike appears to be myth, but that's not his fault. That is uh, something that any, any base runner, good or bad, would fall into. So when I hear it time and time again from one announcer, one ex-player after another, that the runner at second base didn't know where the shortstop was. You shouldn't hear that from an announcer. Well, I do, mister. Well, if you, and now outfielders are different. The first thing you do is check the outfielders. You know where the second baseman, sh uh, second baseman, first baseman, third baseman are. Here's a shallow fly ball to center. You wouldn't think they'd try to score Piazza. They don't. Two out and another missed opportunity. This time it's Peyton guilty of missing the chance. Between innings, I want names of broadcasters <laughs> who said base runners in Played second should, oh, should know where the shortstop is. Yeah. Come on. Bernie Williams does not have a strong throwing arm, but his arm right now is better than Piazza's legs. So Piazza has to hold up at third base. And now it takes a hit from Pratt, who's hitting 155. I just think you're wrong. <laughs> Good. <laughs> First and third, two out. Strike one. There are the numbers for Pratt. Three RBIs on the season, one home run. And he, for the most part, has been the everyday catcher since Piazza went down last Friday. Little floater. In and over. Soriano to his right. A leadoff double. Followed by a one-out single. Followed by more frustration for the Mets. Messina does his job. Mike Piazza right there. There's Derek Jeter. Now you really don't know whether Jeter's going to go over here or whether Jeter's going to stay right there. And that's why Piazza did not know where Jeter was. The shortstop, when you're the runner at second base, the shortstop's the only player that you don't know where he is. Do you think, uh, was that conclusive enough? No, I was convinced. <laughs> Here's Tino Martinez who takes a strike from Kevin Apier. I think Mike even berating himself between innings, uh, thinking that he could have could have scored on that ball, but even with a good break, he probably doesn't make it home. With Tino, his Mar toe. Tino Martinez <laughs> has been hot. His last 11 games, a 381 average. The home runs are starting to fly out of the park again after listening time to time and all the time for a while about Nick Johnson, the first baseman of the future for the Yankees. That's off the hands and back toward us. It's one and two. Last 11 games for Tino. Eight home runs, 19 RBIs. He's slugging 1,000. The second most RBIs by a first baseman since 95. Bagwell leads the way. How is Nick Johnson playing at AAA? 253 average with home runs. Not future Yankee material yet. Drew Henson, the third baseman who broke his wrist earlier in the year. Also struggling. Two balls, two strikes. Tino Martinez started this hot streak. Go back to a game against Cleveland, the 25th of June, talking with Don Mattingly as they talked about in the pregame show today. Don told him to try to stay back on off-speed pitches, but Tino, in this one case, 
wasn't listening. But here is Don Mattingly watching. Talking about Tino and his front hip flying open automatically and too quickly. He had a pinch hit home run. That was on the 25th, his first career pinch hit home run. He got one last night as well, and he has taken off. The plaque for Don Mattingly out in Monument Park. Latino, the guy that replaced a legend here with the Yankees, at least a recent legend, getting tips and pointers from him, and it's really helped turn him around. One ball, no strikes on Posada. Two guys that played against one another in the 1995 Wild Card Series, the division playoffs, Tino Martinez, Don Mattingly, Mattingly's last year. One ball, no strikes, one out, nobody on. Posada, an all-star. Takes ball two, two and oh. I don't think people around baseball give Posada enough credit for the progress he's made over the last couple of years from being Joe Girardi's understudy to being the everyday guy here for the Yankees and what he can do at the plate. Switch hitting catcher with power, 2-0 pitch. It's 3-0. When you talk about Jorge, you have to talk about his offense first because he is a much, much better offensive player than he is a defensive player, even though his innate skills defensively are very good. For instance, he's got a very, very strong throwing arm. He's got good hands, but, I mean, two years ago, they checked Posada's vision and the reason was he was missing a lot of balls off the heel of the glove off the webbing of the glove and sometimes uh, defensively a uh, ball eats him up it should eat up a hitter but it shouldn't eat up a catcher but you'll see that occasionally with Jorge Here's right. Paul O'Neill with one on one out another problem in Jorge's arsenal is is his base running he is uh, one of the poorer base runners in the American League and makes blatant uh, errors in judgment on the bases. Maybe he shouldn't be an all-star, is that what well, you're saying? Well, no, no, I'm not saying that. I think uh, you take the overall package. I mean, base running and catchers are not usually uh, closely allied anyway. Will you quit that? Cunning for me today. Wow. Owen won the count on O'Neill. Trying to give you a complete picture of Mr. Posada's abilities. In all fairness and objectivity. But does he belong on the All-Star team? Absolutely. Owen won the count on O'Neill. Apier. Double play ball, maybe. Apier. Ordonez turns it, the inning is over. That'll do it for the Yankees in the second. Third inning now, no score. Fox Sports, home of the 2001 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Back after this, from your local Fox. In just three days, dream matchups become classic confrontations. The big unit against A-Rod in the city that made both men stars. The American League's best pitchers try to stop Major League home run leader Barry Bonds. Ichiro makes his all-star game debut and we will say so long at least all-star game wise to Cal Ripken and Tony Gwynn their final appearances at this 72nd all-star game in Seattle on Tuesday night. That'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern 5 Pacific right here on Fox. This is Ordonez one ball one strike. We started to talk right before the break I guess about an inning ago about the job Bobby Valentine did as the National League All-Star manager. Two and one on Ordonez and at least in my opinion hats off to him for doing a very thorough job talking to a lot of managers that he's had some problems with in the past personality clashes but he really went about his work and did a good job in my mind of putting that team together. That's down the left field line it's trying to get foul. It's out of play. Two balls, two strikes. Hall of Fame careers. The class of 2007 at the Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. That's a given for Tony Gwynn and Cal Ripken Jr. 
19 time all star 15 time all star and two men who played their entire careers with one organization. Two balls two strikes on Ordonia. Three and two Valentine even I'm sorry I was That's just going to one more point Valentine even went so far as to call Bruce Bochy and ask him if he knew if Henderson was going to call it quits yep. at the end of the year because he thought Henderson deserved mm -hmm. a curtain call of sorts at this all star game coming up and he and Henderson didn't like each other at all. I couldn't agree with you more. The most recent eye of the storm for Bobby is the Cliff Floyd incident Cliff the terrific outfielder for the Florida Marlins where Bobby was engaged in the conversation with his agent Seth. Levinson Cliff Floyd with an expanded roster certainly deserves to be on the all star team that would solve the problems for the managers Tory criticized for taking seven Bobby criticized for not taking Cliff Floyd three balls two strikes on Ardonia and a weekly hit ground ball to Soriano. I, I do think in fairness that Bobby's mistake with the Cliff Floyd incident was making the phone call to Cliff uh, without knowing whether he was going to be on the team or not. There had to have been genuine excitement on the part of Cliff Floyd. Yeah. Especially with the history this season with Bobby Valentine and Cliff Floyd calling Valentine a stupid manager. Mm -hmm. Prior to that Valentine being happy that Floyd had been drilled in a will hit you you hit us kind of series with the Marlins earlier in the season that had seemingly been put to bed Valentine makes the call in Floyd's words Valentine said unless something crazy happens I shouldn't tell you this but you're going to be on the team Valentine says I didn't say that I said you're on the bubble yep. but whatever the conversation if Valentine went so far as to call Cliff Floyd I'm sure Cliff took that as well he's calling me to make sure I'm going to go and play yeah. for him if he's bothering to call me I must be going. Mm -hmm. That's my view on that. Sixteen thousand dollars worth of airline tickets that the agent said Levinson says is the smoking gun and I think that's ridiculous. I mean you mean to tell me you can't turn in sixteen thousand dollars worth of tickets they might charge you seventy five bucks a ticket but I mean come on please. You got to turn it over to the major league umpires or NBA officials. <laughs> they know what to do with tickets. <laughs> oh and two the count on McEwing. One ball two strikes. The key is trying to hand those tickets off to somebody in Montreal who wants to go to the all star game that's where some of those flights originate all star game what what baseball now I've got Montreal against me that's the third and five I will run that risk well the last uh, the last time the rosters were expanded was 1969. And eight teams have come into baseball since that time. 1977 and 1993, and then most recently in 1998. And the rosters have not been expanded. That to me is just hard headedness on the part of baseball. That's down the line and foul still one and two. And I would imagine the reason that they don't do that is because of incentives in the contracts uh, that give. Uh, uh, players fifty thousand dollars extra a hundred thousand dollars whatever whatever you negotiate and let's be honest about it Valentine's job was made easier by how poorly the Mets have played this season sure. he wasn't tempted to take his players mm -hmm. I mean you can make arguments for Stanton and Jeter you can't make very strong arguments for players on this Mets club other than Reed who is going for the second time and he did not participate his first time through and Mike Piazza and again nice to see a guy who's been there before eight times although he didn't play his eighth time last year because of the concussion and wants to go back and wants to be a part of a night where Ripken and Gwynn will both be on it and still one and two on McEwen but who else was Valentine going to take from his own club so it opened up you know a handful of opportunities 
for other players around the league to get a shot at. Clemens, even though Joe Torre won't say it because he has promised the American League that he won't reveal it, Major League Baseball is going to be the starter. You have to believe on Tuesday night. Up the middle, and McEwing has a one out hit. Now, what a great at bat by Super Joe. That's why he gets that nickname. Fouling off a lot of tough pitches and finally got a high fastball out over the plate that he rifles up the middle. Nice job there. Joe Torre promised Major League Baseball he wouldn't reveal the name of his starter on Tuesday night. Here are his thoughts on who will be on the mound to start it for the American League on July 10th. Uh, I tell you, it would be a pretty safe guess, but um, uh, after promising Phil Harris, who is my, the love of my life, uh, that I keep this thing a secret. Uh, you know, I, I think for sure he's one of a couple of guys who, because of when they pitched, uh, are definitely ready to start on Tuesday. If you can read through that, you have to believe that Clemens is the guy. He was actually working on the side today prior to the game in a tune up for that Tuesday start. Throwing down in the bullpen before the start of the game with Mel Stottlemyre. McEwing has extended his hitting streak to 10 games, 15 shy of his career best, and he draws a throw from the scene. Roger Clemens soon turns 39, and if he does start for the American League, he will be the oldest starter in American League history. The oldest starter in Major League history, Warren Spahn, who started when he was 40 and a half, which is <laughs> remarkable. One ball, no strikes on Relliford, one of the few surprises for the Mets, at least pleasant surprises for the Mets this season. They've had a lot of surprises, not many of them are pleasant. 2 0 the count on Relliford. Roger Clemens also, talk about the oldest pitcher in American League history to start an All Star game, will have a 15 year gap between All Star game starts dating back to 1986. That's the longest gap between starts. 2 0 on Relford. 1. He has been on a roll, and it has not just covered the start of this season for the Yankees. Roger Clemens has finally settled in and pitched like the pitcher they thought they were getting when they traded David Wells and others to get him from Toronto. Winner of only 14 games in 1999 and did not pitch well, ended up 14 and 10. Was on the DL part of the first half of last season. But since July 1st of last year, he has been dominating. Runner at first with one out, two balls and a strike on Relliford. Desi hitting 288. Talked about the difference in Messina's numbers from the windup as opposed to the stretch, and it comes into play here. And the right side of the infield is open with Martinez holding against McEwing. Most curveball pitchers have a tougher time pitching from the stretch than they do from the windup because, in order to throw the good curveball, the lower body has to come into play. And from the stretch, it does so less so. Runner going, throw by Posada, high, and out. McEwing called out, even with that sailing throw from Posada. Valentine's going to argue, and I don't blame him. Looks safe from up here. I'll tell you, Bobby Valentine going out on the field right now with all the things that have happened to the Mets this year, that's an angry Bobby Valentine going out there right now. I've always said that a a manager has more of a chance to be thrown out of a game on a day game after a night game because they don't get a lot of rest. But with all of the things that have happened to the Mets this year, Valentine out to argue the play and not that vocal. But I thought he was safe also. The throw from Posada is high, but a quick tag and an athletic tag by Jeter, and he was safe. He was safe. I'm not so sure anymore. No? Yeah. Thought so. Yep. Tag is late. Foot's already on the bag. McEwing in the process of coming up when the tag was made. 
Here's a 2 2 to Relaford, and that's a foul tip. The reason Posada threw the ball high to second base is Relaford was in his way. If Valentine can argue that and appeared Mike Ewing was safe, well, then Joe Torrey could have argued the fact that Relaford was in the way in taking the pitch, not swinging, that causing Posada to make the high throw. Two balls, two strikes, two out, nobody on. It'll stay that way. Ewing now four stolen bases. He's been caught three times. Relaford trying to get on in front of Alfonso. He was only one out of 13 since coming off the disabled list on Tuesday. 2-2. Two -two. Full count. Here's that play once again. Now you can understand Relaford making this movement if he had swung at the pitch, but he took the pitch. So that causes Posada to make the throw over Relaford, causing the throw to be high to Jeter. Interesting play. And a base hit into left follows it, which is the way things have gone for the Mets. Relaford is on with two outs, and the batter will be Alfonso. And the Mets wondering what this inning might have brought, at least at this point, without that call down at second base. Absolutely. Now Alfonso mentioned one out of 13 since coming off the disabled list with his bad back. And this guy is a big reason why an injury is a big factor in it why the Mets have been disappointing offensively this season he is one of the best players in baseball period. Ball one Joe if uh, McEwing is called safe at second base Relaford drives him in and then unless Alfonso hits into a double play you assure Mike Piazza hitting with somebody on base. So so far this has. Uh, this has been an inning that has more described the Mets season thus far than anything else. Here's a 1 0. Now Relaford is running, but Alfonso pops it up. Glasses on, gloves shielding the glasses and eyes, and that'll do it. Two hits. Did you know that today's aerial coverage is being provided by the Monster.com blimp? Monster.com is a proud sponsor of the 2002 Olympic Winter Games and the 2002 U.S. Olympic team. Monster.com, job good, life good. Life is good around here for the Yankees, winners of 12 of their last 14 and owners of a game and a half lead in the AL East. Spencer with a hard hit ball, but out number one in the third. And a very good start for Kevin Apier. And a good job by Mark Johnson. Johnson, normally a first baseman, making a rather nice play on that ball hit by Spencer. Right field is not the problem here at Yankee Stadium. Before this game is over, regulation, extra innings, what have you, in all probability, as it often happens, there's going to be a problem in left field. It's the toughest sun field for left field in the major leagues. As Yogi used to say, it gets late early out there. Well, it does. Here's Brocious, and there's strike one. That's one of the reasons Joe Torre has his best defensive left fielder in left field today. Right field is not so much of a problem. But in left field, looking up at that sun, Joe McEwing, inexperienced, it could be a problem. That's foul on the count 0 and 2. Fortunately for Joe and Center fielder Jay Payton they do have a little cloud cover serve as backdrops if it were all blue it would be a higher sky but center and left field left center down the line tough. Oh two Brocious is gone and that's strikeout number three for Apier and I think Scott is saying is that on the pitch or on the check swing. How is that strike three he wants to know. It's not where Pratt catches the ball but where it goes over the plate. Pratt caught it low, but it appeared it was borderline. Here's Soriano, who homered last night, has six, 24 stolen bases. 
His walk total is up to 13, and he's hitting 265. Solid start as an everyday player at the big league level, to say the least, for Soriano. And learning a new position at the big league level. Strike one. Would you say Wrigley Field, right field, is mm -hmm. the toughest right field? Yes. And Candlestick, of course, in uh, San Francisco, the elements there, probably the toughest in baseball, but that is no longer. 0 oh, 2, the count on Soriano. It's the elements in Wrigley and Old Candlestick because you not only had the sun, but the wind, the two, combination of the two were very, very difficult on outfielders. Here's an 0-2 to Soriano. Ball and two strikes. Apier, we mentioned last Sunday night, a two to one win. He went eight, allowing no runs on three hits, six strikeouts, no walks. And today he's faced the minimum facing this hot Yankee lineup. As he's ahead of the count of one and two in the number nine hitter, Soriano. Two. Let's go back in time. The first of July, before all those Fourth of July barbecues, and the effort, the strikeouts, three of the six he compiled that night in Atlanta for the two-to-one victory. Last eight starts, ERA terrific. Mets record in those starts, not good. Into center, Peyton. Inning over. If you don't know it, if you didn't watch the pregame show, shame on you, but we'll talk about a big factor now in the NL East, the loss of Furcal to the Braves when we come back in the fourth. More than the fourth inning, Piazza doubled his first time. Takes a ball inside. 275 average, 21 home runs, 47 RBIs. Breaking ball drops low. It's 2 and 0. The New York Mets have no players in the top 10 hitting categories across the National League except Robin Ventura is tied for eighth and walks. That's it. Two balls and a strike as Piazza took a big rip. Interleague action. Mike Piazza is one of the best in the game. A 364 average. A lot of that against the Yankees. A lot of that against Roger Clemens. Slugging percentage big, 21 home runs, 62 RBIs. 2-1, two, 2-2. Two two. Doesn't appear too effective by that left big toe. No, he doesn't. I guess it would uh, be more painful if it was the right big toe because that would be the toe off of which he had to push instead of landing. Two and two the count. Messina struck out four. That's down the line and foul. Well, it's unfortunate that catchers get used to pain. And, and it's a very it's an unfortunate thing, but it's it's part of your life. And here's a here's a guy with a broken left big toe. That's a it's the distal phalanx bone. Down on strikes there, and that's more painful than the left foot right now. But that's uh, one of the things you have to carry around, the fact that uh, most of the time you hurt. And hurting is not unusual. That's why a guy like Piazza can play uh, with the broken left big toe where, where other guys perhaps couldn't play. Distal phalanx is one of the old Roman war tactics, isn't it? Phalanx, not phalanx. <laughs> I guess the toes themselves are kind of a, a phalanx when you think about it. They are. One out, nobody on for Johnson. And a strike, thigh high for Mike Messina. Well, we talked about Rafael Fercal. Mm -hmm. Talk about the injury to Piazza. They lost him for basically a week. Rafael Fercal earlier in the season, they lost him for a week after this play. Jamming that left shoulder, and then last night, in one of the more awkward, more acrobatic slides you'll see, sliding into second base, popped up into the air. He said he slid too late. 
And he dislocated his left shoulder and he may be lost for the rest of the season. That is an enormous loss to the Atlanta Braves. They will not replace him. They no can't. question. Nope, they cannot replace him. Mark DeRosa will probably be the regular second baseman. And they will mix and match at shortstop. And he is, uh, we were even talking about uh, Rafael last uh, week. And it was my opinion that for Kyle was the guy that put the Braves over the hump and would be the difference if they overtake the Philadelphia Phillies. A game behind him after winning a series over Philadelphia. Maddox winning the final game. It's impossible to replace that kind of speed at the top right. of the lineup. They're already struggling trying to protect Chipper Jones in the middle of their lineup. They really don't have much protection for him there, at least consistent protection. Ryan Jordan with a big game winning hit last night in the extra innings to win the game for Atlanta and Boston after a blown save, by the way. Here's a 1 2 to Johnson, 2 and 2. As Messina hits the glove. But for the Atlanta Braves, that is a big blow. It really is. He just seemed to start to figure it out as well, getting mm -hmm. on top of the ball, mm -hmm. chopping it on the infield, using the speed. Here's the 2 2 to Johnson, full count. Speaking of the Philadelphia Phillies, Jimmy Rollins, the shortstop, and he's a good one, will be going to the All Star game as the Phillies representative. Johnson stays alive as Posada could not hang on. The last time the Phillies had a representative at shortstop was when their manager, Larry Boa, played in the All Star game in 1974. Posada cannot hold on to the foul tip. Rollins has now set the Phillies consecutive stolen base mark and it was Boa's record that he broke with over 21. There's a base hit the opposite way and for the Mets their fifth hit of the game. Johnson one out of two and the batter will be Zeal one on one out. I know if you talk to Jimmy Rollins he would tell you that he wished Bobby Valentine had selected Ricky Henderson to go to the All Star game because Jimmy grew up in Oakland. And Ricky was his hero. He was playing with the Phillies when Ricky Henderson broke Babe Ruth's record for walks this year in late April in San Diego. Then Ricky tried to steal second base and Jimmy tagged him out. <laughs> one on one out. Zeal took a strike throw down and Johnson gets back. Zeal is. Stunned that that first pitch was called strike one. And he gets into it with a home plate umpire. Now Bobby Valentine gets into it with a home plate umpire. That pitch appeared to be high. You know, Joe, you and I both agreed Bobby can't believe it. And we said uh, the argument earlier in the game Bobby is not in a good mood today, folks. I don't think he'll last the game. Nah, there's, there's, a, there's a possibility of that. Maybe even change to a probability of that. One on, one out, the 0 1. One ball, one strike on Zeal. It all depends on the patience on the part of the home plate umpire, Andy Fletcher, or some other base umpire. As to whether Bobby Valentine will make it if the first three innings, three innings plus, are any indication. One and two. The whole idea of ejecting a manager is almost ridiculous. I mean, they just go out of. <laughs> now I'm saying this about Valentine, a guy who came back with a disguise on the bench a couple of years ago. But they just leave the dugout area and they manage the game from 10 feet away <laughs> instead of on the bench. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. You, you could say after that uh, that second fastball was called called a strike to Todd Zeal Bobby in giving the signs to third base coach John Stearns slapping his left forearm even getting mad when he's transferring the signs to his third base coach. Here's a 2 2 pitch to Zeal stays alive. 
Oh, I said it. I'm sorry, people. June 9th, 1999. Bobby Valentine is gone, but not for long. You know, that thing gets weirder every time you see it. <laughs> Sitting in the dugout. With the eye black instead of a mustache, the glasses. Two balls, two strikes, now full count. Looking more like Peter Sellers walking the beat. <laughs> Does your dog bite? <laughs> He's still mad. A little shake of the head. It has just been a nightmarish season so far for the Mets. Three balls, two strikes. I bet they start the runner. He's going and Zeal fouls it away. If there's one guy in this Mets lineup that Bobby Valentine trusts to put the bat on the ball, it's Zeal. Jay Payton, a struggling Jay Payton, waits to hit next. Three balls, two strikes. Runner goes. Zeal takes strike three, and that lending it. Strike him out, throw him out, double play. Zeal took strike three, and that started the first double play of the day for the Yankees. It's getting more and more interesting between the home plate umpire and Bobby Valentine. Between innings, the home plate umpire went, <laughs> went over to the dugout. Bobby Valentine ended up putting his hands over his ears. Watch this. <laughs> and then using his debating techniques afterwards said I know you are but what am I. <laughs> I can't hear you. But you know what the home plate umpire shouldn't walk over there. No you're right. Ordonia is to his left. Not blocked is gone. He's 0 for 2. Bobby's first line was probably did Cliff Floyd send you over here. <laughs> <laughs> or his agent Seth Levinson. Obviously not a laughing matter to Bobby right now, but the Mets are finding nothing to laugh about. Also not a laughing matter to Seth Levinson or no, to Floyd. No, no. Here's Derek Jeter, one out, nobody on. By the way, all Seth Levinson is doing is protecting his client. Sure, absolutely. So I don't fault him on that. No. Trying to come up with no. some reason, the smoking gun theory. Yeah. It was worth a shot. One ball, one strike, and while everything else has gone on, and that ejection happened because of umpire's warnings and a couple of his players getting hit after the warning. And then his pitcher Wendell throwing behind Mike Matheny and he came out and said hey what's going on when Wendell was ejected for not hitting a Cardinal. Valentine was ejected in that game a game that the Mets came off the mat and won with a three run ninth inning an extra inning victory. Two balls and a strike one out nobody on and it's two and two. Turk Wendell was at the part of that confrontation. Jeter grounded out his first time up looking for his 100th hit of the season. Tony Williams on deck. Still two and two. Jeter's last year's All-Star Game Most Valuable Player it was the World Series MVP as well. We'll be going to Seattle for Tuesday night's game. Backing up Alex Rodriguez. By the way, anybody who thinks Alex Rodriguez is not having a tremendous season while the Rangers are 
tripping all over themselves is wrong. He has put up huge numbers. Three balls, two strikes with one out, nobody on. Jeter. To the left side, Ordonez. Slide, throw, two out. That is classic Ordonez. Alex Rodriguez, 25 home runs, 73 RBIs for the Texas Rangers. Marvelous play by Ray Ordonez. The slide, the catch, and the throw. A Radio Shack trivia question in the last All-Star game played in Seattle. Who drove in the game winning run. That's our Radio Shack trivia question. Who had the game winning RBI in the 79 All-Star game at the Kingdome in Seattle. He is here at the park. Bernie Williams strike one. Got a modified shift on for Bernie Williams. This is the only team who employs this particular type of shift with their Donius near second base. Bernie can ground the ball through on the left side. That's why the shift surprises me. You were surprised last night at the positioning of Ordonez, the shortstop with lighter pitching. Yeah. Against, against a right handed bat. Yeah, playing towards second base with Bernie Williams batting right handed. And Bernie, sure enough, single in the hole. He's jammed here in a pop up. Relliford gives it a look. Has a play. Makes the catch. The Yankees go in order. Kevin Apier outstanding. No hits given up through four. Into the fifth. No score at Yankee Stadium. Through four innings. The New York Mets will be a part of our Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week next week. For interleague action as the Red Sox take on the New York Mets. It all begins with this week in baseball. Next Saturday, 12.30 Eastern, 11.30 a.m. Central. Watch the entire baseball season unfold across the Fox networks. Jay Payton first up, the number seven hitter, 0 for 1. Flied into shallow center with first and third one out back in the second and missed an RBI chance. 0 and 2. You may see Mike Messina in that area again as Payton with two strikes as much as any Met hitter. Or any hitter on either side will go after that bad ball away. Messina pitches with as much guile as he does raw ability. Very smart pitcher. Up and in. Peyton is gone, and that seven strikeouts for Messina. Our Radio Shack trivia question in the last All-Star game played in Seattle, which was 1979, who drove in the game-winning run? Our Radio Shack answer. There's the question. Lee Mazzilli with a bases loaded RBI walk. Earlier he had homered. That's right. Yeah. So Lee Mazzilli was now the first base coach for Joe Torre and a former member of the New York Mets is the answer to the Radio Shack trivia question. Radio Shack, you've got questions, we've got answers. Here is Pratt, and that is strike two. Pratt. Left side, base hit. A one out single for Todd Pratt. Oh, Lee Mazzilli in the 79 All Star game. First, a home run off Jim Kern. Just over the wall and left. And then the bases loaded walk to win the game for the National League. That was Ron Guidry on the mound, that fastball high and away. The one thing I remember about that game, Joe, were the two throws made by Dave Parker, who shared the MVP awards, I, I believe, with uh, Gary Carter that year. But Dave Parker with tremendous throws, took one to third and one to home. Carter, at the end of one of those throws, the throw to home, made a terrific block of home plate. Mm -hmm. Here are the throws by Parker. 
first. The throw to third to get Jim Rice. Ron Say with a tag. And then the line drive base hit into right. Watch the play by Carter on the back end of this. Totally sealed off home plate and they get the out. The 79 All-Star game, the King Dome in Seattle. I too remember those two throws from watching it as a kid. Ardonias takes a strike, the count 0 and 2. Lima Zilli, who we talked about, was the answer to our Radio Shack trivia question. Came to the Mets. The Mets at that time in the late 70s were hungry for stars, and this was a Brooklyn guy, good looking guy, and he was heavily promoted by the New York Mets. Matinee Idol. Played with Joe Torre and under Joe Torre with the Mets. Ordonez takes ball one. Later played with the Yankees for a short while. And now the first base coach taking over for Jose Cardinal for Joe Torre. One ball, two strikes, one on, one out, no score in the fifth inning, and Ordonez takes ball two. Ordonez with the second highest ground ball out to fly ball out ratio in the league. Second to Juan Pierre of Colorado. The difference between the two is Juan Pierre can run. Ordonez is not very fast. He's already grounded out once in this game, so what do you do? You don't want him to hit it in the air. He doesn't have power to get it out of the park. He's grounding into a lot of outs, and all of that has combined for a 226 average. What Dave Engel, the hitting coach of the Mets, is trying to get Ray to do is shoot for the hole on the right side, especially with two strikes. See, he's trying to pull the ball, and by trying to pull the ball, you pull off the ball. And that's the worst thing and the most universal thing that hitters do when they're going poorly is pull off the ball. You can see that extension right there. That left shoulder pulling out of there. If on the other hand you point that shoulder back to the pitcher or exaggerate it and point it the other way you get more hits the other way. Shot of Dave Engel the hitting coach for the Mets. Messina with a count of two and two. Ordonez the opposite way and right through Soriano. Pratt will turn but hold. Potential double play ball. It was scorched, but Soriano couldn't handle it. Two on, one out. It'll be interesting to see how this is scored, but look at the front shoulder of Ordonez there. Really staying with that fastball away. He hits it hard in between hop for Soriano. I'd give him a hit. That looks like an easier play than it really is not defending Soriano but that is a very very difficult play ball was hit hard and there you can see Ray Ardonius really staying with this fastball and hits it right on the sweet spot. So it's going to be an error. I don't particularly agree with that uh, scoring but that's all right. That's error number nine for Soriano. A let's go Mets cheer tries to escape from the sold out crowd at Yankee Stadium as McEwing takes a ball and it was at least kept at the plate by Posada on anything but a textbook stop by the Yankee catcher. Reason it's not textbook is he had to backhand the ball whenever a ball's in the dirt and a catcher goes after it and he backhands the ball generally speaking it's the wrong way to go about it. Because by backhanding the ball, he's trying to catch the ball, and you don't catch balls in the dirt, you block them. McEwing could put the Mets on top here in the fifth inning. A hit, an error. And it's 2 0. Pratt, the lead runner. Ordonia is the trail runner at first. With runners in scoring position and 042 average for McEwing. Two 
two and one. Like you talked about earlier, pretty good indication as to how Messina's throwing. A fastball count, and he got a fastball, and he fouled it back. Just like Mark uh, Johnson did his last at bat. Messina has enough to blow it by you, at least through the first six innings. He does have a tendency to tire the last three innings, but uh, that's generally the case with most starters nowadays. Well, Stottlemyre, the pitching coach on your right, now McEwing trying to figure out Messina to put the Mets on top. That's foul, and it's two and two. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Now the crowd tries to get into it. An 8 3 win last night for the Yankees. No score here in the fifth inning today. Messina struck out seven. Eight. Joe McEwing does not strike out a lot but he takes that fastball inside inside corner says Andy Fletcher and he punches McEwing out. So now two on two out. The best time to pitch hitters inside is with two strikes. Relaford is one out of two. Ball one. The good hitters protect the plate with two strikes. The better the hitter, the more vulnerable he is to the inside fastball. Talking about the guile of Mike Messina. Smart. I've heard Messina described as a power pitcher, at least with his stuff, with more of a finesse pitcher's mentality. Hmm. Hmm. He can't blow it by you, but he's out there thinking and pitching and not rearing back and Throwing it as hard as he can. That's strike one, one ball, one strike. Well, Mike, Mike is of the mental makeup uh, that he finds it, it seems to me. I've never really talked to him about this, but it seems to me that the, the mental challenge of getting hitters out is equal to the physical challenge, and he enjoys that as much. Well, if you graduate from Stanford in three years, <laughs> yeah. you probably enjoy the mental challenge. Yeah, yeah right. Economics degree, which is nice for free agents. And a six year, $88.5 million contract. Mm -hmm. That is macro economics. Two on, two out, one ball, one strike. There's high gas in the count one and two. Relaford going after a questionable pitch. Now a moose call as this Yankee fan base wants pitch number 95 to be strikeout number nine. Ooh. Desi, hello. Out here at Yankee Stadium used to give the same moose call for Moose Scouring. Different callers. Yeah. Same families, perhaps. Two on, two out, one ball, two strikes. Relaford did not take a two strike swing on that last pitch. Two and two and blocked by Posada. On deck is Alfonso. On the bases, Pratt and Ordonia. So basically 100 pitches here 
in the fifth inning. Relaford spoiled it. Pretty good little player, Desi Relaford. Yes, he is. And a you guy bet. that the Phillies may have given up on too quickly. They had Jimmy Rollins. They wanted to clear the way for him. Relaford made a stop out in San Diego, and the Mets did well to sign him as a bench player. A little emergency swing right there, but he is a very adaptable player starting at third today for the injured Ventura. That is hit high and deep into right, but foul. Not all that deep, but it was high and it was foul. Still two and two. Another chance for the Mets. They have stranded three. Lost a man stealing. Strike him out, throw him out, double play. All star game in three days. And Relaford trying to put the Mets out in front. And Messina and Posada cannot get together. Plate coverage is good at uh, dining room tables and in the batter's box and we have seen uh, Desi Relaford on the change up off the plate away foul a ball off and then foul off an inside fastball a lot of times in, instead of getting together on particular pitches to call the pitcher and a catcher are far apart on where to throw the next pitch location another two two. And a little fly ball into left. Messina gets around another tight spot. Tim talked about how hard it is to play left field. Shane Spencer just proved it with that catch. That's nice. Good way to go to break. No score. Baseball is brought to you by BF Goodrich Tires. Take control by Rolades. Rolades, R O L A I D S, spells relief. By Napa Auto Parts. Napa, we keep America running. And by Mercury. Now at your local Mercury dealer today. What's it like in a blimp on a day like this in the Bronx? Well, they know. And that bright orange monster up in the sky today the monster.com blimp providing us with great views of Yankee Stadium monster.com job good life good bottom of the fifth inning Tino Martinez Jorge Posada and Paul O'Neill for the Yankees and the strike the front the knees according to the home plate umpire it's probably easier seeing a fly ball from the monster.com blimp than it is from left field looking up whenever a fielder looks away after making the catch you know, they just thank their lucky stars that uh, the ball landed in the glove just put the glove somewhere in the area and hope it lands in the pocket <laughs> turn your face away <laughs> so that if you miss it it doesn't hit you in the face right <laughs> Oh, and two, the count on Martinez. On cue, on cue, exhaling. Did you know that Apier is not allowed to hit? I did. One ball, two strikes. Are we immune from all that jinx stuff up here? I've never quite understood the, the fact that, well, we broke it the day that uh, David Cohn Cone pitched the the perfect game. Back in 1999, July 17th, 
One out strikeout number four. Right now for a break let's go back to Jeannie in the studio of Speed Pass Game Break brought to you by Mobile. Joe from a no hitter to a big bopper. Top point Jake Bass is loaded for Mark McGuire in a one for 32 slump. He's retiring all right retiring baseballs big lead for the Cardinals bottom four Joe. I got 48 phone calls yesterday about Mark McGuire and the story about him retiring at the end of the year. I left St. Louis. It was on the front page of the Post Dispatch in St. Louis. As flies one into center, should be the second out as Peyton fights the Sun. Two down. And I think anybody, I think the Post Dispatch is guilty of taking a comment made by a frustrated player on a frustrating team. I mean, the Cardinals have been terrible since the first month and a half of the season. And you know better than I know that when things aren't going well for a team and you aren't playing well individually and Mark's not a young guy 37 you get frustrated. Sure. But that's all it is. I mean, there's nothing more to it than that. Especially since he's got 30 million dollars sitting out there for him for the next two years. 30 million dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doctor. Evil. <laughs> Ball one. Paul O'Neill. He is 0 for 1. He bounced into a 1 6 3 double play his first time up. O'Neill has found his name on the lineup card all over the place this season. Batting in the number six spot. Last night wasn't even in the lineup against the left hander Leiter as they started Gerald Williams, who they picked up since we last talked to you. Here's a 1 0. 2 0. Interesting to note, while Kevin Apier still has a no hitter, that the New York Mets have never had a pitcher pitch a no hitter in their 49 year history. They've had former Met pitchers pitch no hitters, just not wearing that uniform. That's correct. 39 year history. Here's a 2 0. It's 3 0. The last one to do it was Dwight Gooden for the Yankees here against Seattle. Tom Seaver did it when he was with Cincinnati. Nolan Ryan had a few. Yep, after he, he left the Mets. Mets. Uh, only had seven, that's all. Seven, no hitters. Seven. Three and oh the count. O'Neill with two out, nobody on. Three and one. How about that? A breaking ball on a 3-0 count to Paul O'Neill. Think Kevin Apier doesn't realize he has a no no? Here's a 3 1. To the right side and foul. Just foul. Thirty two years ago tomorrow. Tom Seaver's near perfect game against the Cubs. Eight and two thirds. Three balls, two strikes, two out, nobody on as Apier tries to battle back from a 3 0 count. Apier got it. 87 mile an hour fastball and O'Neill went up and after it and he's gone five strikeouts no hits one walk sixth inning no score sixth inning of a scoreless game our a and w fan cam Ella Fitzgerald it's lovely going through the It's very fancy on old Delancey Street, you know. The subway charms us so when balmy breezes blow to and fro. And tell me what street compares with Mott Street in July. Sweet push carts gently glide. The 
Great big cities of wondrous toys. Manhattan. Just made for Ella Fitzgerald. And after Alfonso grounded to short, Mike Piazza will stand in here in the Bronx. Piazza one out of two with a double and a strikeout. No score, sixth inning. Messina and Apier. Dominant here today. Ball one up and in, and Apier has not allowed a hit through five. Messina has allowed no runs on six hits. Words to that song. This great big city's a wondrous toy, and here's the erector set of the Mets right here. Mike Piazza. Here's a 1 0 pitch right here, and that's a strike poured in over the inside corner. Mike with 21 home runs on the season. That's down the line and foul. Strike two. Mike Piazza trusts that guard on his left foot. He says those pitches down and in or over the inside part of the plate don't bother him at all. And that was an example of it. Back too quick on it as he jerked it into the seats. One out, nobody on, one ball, two strikes, top of the sixth inning. Two out. Right now, back to Jeannie in the studio with a speed pass game break brought to you by Mobile. Uh, Joe, Mark McGuire, give us the Cardinals a four run lead. Kenny Lofton, take us away. Bottom four, the three run shot off Andy Bennis. And we're all tied up now. Bottom four. Everybody has six. Joe? Jeannie, thank you. Disappointing season for Andy Bennis, to say the least. And now Mark Johnson stands in with two out, nobody on. Ball one. Joe, we talked about how Mike P Mike Messina is a East-West pitcher. Look at him hit the mitt of Posada for strike three against Piazza. He was on the far east coast for that pitch. Man. That goes to 2 and 0 and he has barely missed with the first two to Johnson. We may have seen Mike Messina pitch his best game ever when he struck out 15 against the Cleveland Indians in the 1997 American League Championship Series game three in Cleveland. 15 strikeouts seven innings pitched. An LCS record too shy of a postseason record. Set by. There's a strike over the inside corner. Gibson in 1968. It is 17 against Detroit. Come back to the present, Tim. <laughs> Work this game. Don't think about that game. Stay with me. I just fell into a little state I know, of reverie. I saw that. Yeah. That look come over you. The glazed expression. <laughs> The drool on your <laughs> shirt sleeve. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. Zeal will be next if Johnson can keep this top of the sixth inning alive for the Mets. This crowd looking for strikeout number 10. Full count. Three two pitch. Inning over. Strikeout number 10. And Kevin Apier will head back to work against the bottom three in the Yankee lineup. Spencer, Brocia, Soriano coming up. No score. At Yankee Stadium, Kevin Apier heads back to work. The only blemish on his record, a one out walk back in the second. That was erased as O'Neill followed the walk with a double play ball. Five strikeouts, no hits, and Shane Spencer first up for the Yankees. 
and a strike on the outside corner. Yankees have hit only three balls out of the infield today. Apier in total control. On 0 and 1. One ball, one strike. I guess you could say you're in total control with total control. I mean, he has been moving the ball in and out, breaking balls behind in the count. Charlie Huff, the pitching coach of the Mets, has to be very, very happy. Here's a 1-1. One, one. In the left field, forget about the no-hitter. A leadoff single by Spencer. One of the few pitches that the Yankees have seen in the middle of the plate. You can see Pratt's glove was there and the pitch is there. So Apier missing with that slider and Shane Spencer taking advantage of it. Apier who has two one hitters can only hope for his third. By the way it's a nothing nothing game here in the sixth inning. We'll see what the Yankees do with Brocious. They try to push Spencer down to second. I think they will. He's going to punt and he takes a ball. Joe Torre and Don Zimmer do this often. They'll put the bunt on on the first pitch, bring the infield in, particularly with Relaford at third base, inexperienced somewhat, and then put the hit and run on on a 1 0 or 2 1 count. That way you always have the, the infield in a state of flux. Teams with no no hitters all time in their franchise history. Mets have been around since 1962 and they still don't have one including today. Apier gives up a leadoff hit to Spencer here in the sixth inning. Seaver came close twice to mend something that I said earlier. 32nd anniversary of the game at Shea Stadium. Four to nothing win a one hitter for Tom Seaver the near perfect game a one out single to left field by Jimmy Qualls broke up that effort. Rocious drop bunt it is perfect. Zeal's only play to first sacrifice good three four and the go ahead run at second with only one out. Seaver went as far as eight and two thirds one day at Wrigley and with two out Joe Wallace had a base hit to avoid the no hitter there. That is a blueprint by Brocious. You can see the bat in fair territory the ball in fair territory and the sacrifice successful. That's one of the great descriptions I've ever heard of a baseball play catch the ball with the bat when you're bunting. It says a lot for Soriano here that they bunt with Brocious to get the go ahead run Spencer into scoring position for Soriano. Soriano, who homered last night, a free swinger, goes after that pitch, strike one. Not as free a swinger as he was earlier in the season. Still, he's not up there looking for a walk. The other scores brought to you by Lamisil. As you saw, the scores shooting across the bottom of your screen and the promotion for Tuesday night's All Star game in Seattle. Lead off hit, good bunt, and 0 1 pitch to Soriano. One ball, one strike. Alfonso fly to center his first time up. Soriano with runners in scoring position under 200 at 187 for the season. Two balls and a strike. You would think in this situation if you're Apier a veteran pitcher against a young free swinging player like Soriano who's up there trying to put the Yankees on top you can exploit his strike zone tease him don't challenge you right. yep let's see what he gives him on two and one 
Breaking ball and a pop up into shallow right center. Who wants it? Johnson, a long run, two out. And the go ahead run still at second, two away from Knobloch. You can see Todd Pratt. He is almost off the plate, and the pitch is off the plate. And Soriano hits it off the end of the bat. I got it, I got it, says Mark Johnson for the second out. So now it's Knobloch. Chuck has only 28 RBIs and an average of 252. Ball one. Apier definitely stringing together back to back strong starts. He's been good over the past few weeks. Trying to keep his shutout going to keep it a nothing nothing game here in the sixth inning. And he's 2 0 on Knobloch. The more dangerous hitter, Jeter on deck. And this has been the story for Apier, either real good or real bad, and gone real quick. His five wins and ERA well under two. Strikeouts way up, hits way down. When he has lost, he has lost big. Now it's three and up. Jeter, who's 10 out of his last 29, waits to hit next. Knobloch is one of the guys that Joe Torrey does not like to hit 3 and 0 with. Doubtful he'll be swinging here. Now now block. If they see something he likes, we'll take a rip. Try to get the Yankee fans on their feet. Spencer, the only hit of the day so far for the Yankees. Now block chased a bad ball for strike two. Uncharacteristic of Knobloch, whether he's going good or bad, that he would swing at a, a pitch like that. When the count's in his favor. Gary Dinbo, the hitting instructor on the left. Hate to have a check swing with the count three and one. You can understand that 0 and 2, 1 and 2, but not 3 1. Talk about a sure sign of a guy pressing. Yeah, yeah. Talked about the non trade with Seattle. His own performance on the field with his on base percentage, his average dropping since the first month of the season. He put the Yankees on top. Any of the inning for Jeter. He does the latter. Ball four, and that's the second walk of the day by Apier. And now he faces a much more difficult task in trying to get Jeter. Two ninety four average, forty one RBIs. And the All-Star stands in with two on, two out. Most games between these two teams, whether it's been interleague play or World Series play, have been tight. Another entry on that long list. Nothing, nothing in the sixth inning. Two on, two out for Jeter. Into right center field. Peyton going to get it. Inning over and good work by Apier to get around the leadoff hit and the good bunt. Fox Sports home of the 2001 Major League Baseball All-Star Game returns to Yankee Stadium after a break from your local Fox station. Two balls no strikes one out nobody on Messina to Peyton. Now it's three and oh. Those players gathered around him and he asked the questions. 
been talking to McGuire about what sort of smell there was when he fouled a pitch back. If he ever smelled burnt wood. McGuire agreeing with him. And guys who played in his time, even the guys who play now and get a chance to run across Ted Williams, we know that he has been battling some health problems. It is amazing how much he knows, knew and knows about players then and now and their different characteristics and how they approach at bats and what they like to hit, how they take certain pitches. He is definitely a student of the game still. Todd Pratt now one on one out after the walk to Peyton. First walk of the day by Messina. That's nothing new. It's only his 21st walk of the entire season. Strike one on Pratt. And if you're an announcer, uh, he doesn't let up on us either. I remember getting out of a cab in 1993, the night before the All Star game, and have him bellowing across the uh, the lot at the Harbor Court Hotel in Baltimore. So I heard you talking the other night. Pitch bonds inside. Bananas. You ever seen him turn on an inside fastball? Come on. I said, Ted, don't take it so seriously. What are you talking about? He was great. Well, if he sees you after today, he might talk to you about knowing where the shortstop plays if you're running out of second base. One on, one out. No balls, one strike on Pratt. No score in the seven. Pratt out in front to pop up. Brocious. Two out. Two out. Now the number nine hitter who's 0 for 2, Ray Ordonez, walks to the plate. Ordonez is grounded out, reached on an error, and as we talked about at the time, could have gone as a hit or an error, a smash to the second baseman Soriano, who could not field it. So at least Ordonez has hit the ball hard here today against Messina. Not many can say that. And Shane Spencer can say that about AP. The only Yankee hit. Pens quiet here in the seventh inning. Two out, a runner at first, and Ordonez. This would be a time to run if you felt so inclined. Ordonez up and after a pitch, way out of the strike zone, and Tino Martinez puts it away. Ordonez likes the high pitch. That pitch is up there, and he's the final out of the top of the seventh time. It is a beautiful day. U2 has already come and gone, but it still is a beautiful day here in New York. And Kevin Apier has had a wonderful day on the mound. One hit, two walks, only one runner stranded because of a double play. The Yankees have been flat out shut down. Williams, Martinez, Posada. Tough inning for Apier. No score, seventh inning, and a strike. From the 33 year old right handed. Action for the Yankees is Jay Watase. The right hander gets loose. Throwing right hander that picked up from San Diego. Messina has a season high of 120 pitches in any one game. He is at 119 right now. So they're paying attention to the clicker down in the dugout as Messina is getting close. One ball, one strike on Williams. And Joe, it stands to reason that when a day game is played after a night game, the pitcher, in theory, has the edge because the night before, while the players were playing, the pitcher was sleeping, particularly a starting pitcher. Two balls and a strike on Williams. It's certainly true today, isn't it? Especially on a Friday night in New York. <laughs> Two balls and a strike. Hunt. 
one of the hottest hitters in the game right now. That didn't catch the strength zone, much to Apier's disappointment. The count three and one. Todd Pratt was sitting inside for that slider. This slider backs up and stays outside to Williams. It's a bad idea to pitch Bernie Williams inside when you're behind in the count. He could put the Yankees up with one swing of the bat. Now watch out here on three and one. Gunning for it. Apier had him out in front. The count full three and two. How hot is Bernie Williams? Well, he's too darn hot. Last 40 games over 400 with his average 12 of his 15 home runs. On base percentage slugging percentage is enormous. Big average in June the best in the majors and he has a full count leading off here in the seventh. Pratt cannot hang on as the foul tip keeps Williams alive. Trying to come inside with that tailing fastball. Tying Bernie William up. And it went off the webbing and on the right toe of Todd Pratt. So a matching set for the Mets behind the plate. Book in big toes. Pratt's either frustrated that he did not catch that pitch. Foul tip, which would have sent Williams back to the dugout, or still in some pain as that ball caught his toe. Three balls, two strikes. And now Bernie Williams has reached base via a hit or a walk in 41 consecutive games. The longest streak this year held by Edgar Martinez of the Seattle Mariners. All-star designated hitter on Tuesday night. His was 43. No bun here, however. Pretty obvious with Brocious last inning. Spencer on at first, but not here. Especially with the way Tino Martinez has been swinging the bat after his tutorial from Don Mattingly. Off on a power tear, and he is nearly grazed by a pitch inside ball one. Wow, that was close. Woo. Tino Martinez has at least one RBI in 11 of his last 12 games. Today, 0 for 2 with a pair of strikeouts. A 1 0. Nicely played by Pratt. 2 0. Pratt still limping around with that sore right foot. That's a fine play right there. Williams a lead off walk. The go ahead run at first with nobody out in the seventh. And a dangerous pitch to Martinez. Might be. See it. The second. Back to first. No throw as the throw hit Bernie Williams, and it's one on one out. They're gonna try, they're gonna try to appeal interference right here. But Bernie Williams made a perfectly legitimate slide. We talked about it earlier. Bobby Valentine running out to second base umpire Dale Scott, who is the crew chief. Beg your pardon, Larry Young's the crew chief here. And Dale Scott's going to get some help. But Bernie Williams, it was a perfectly legitimate slide. And there is nothing that says, unless you go in standing up, nothing that says that if the ball hits you, watch Ordonius dropping down, Bernie Williams throwing that left arm up, but it wasn't intentional. Bobby Valentine, I think, is saying it is. It hit Bernie in the left wrist. Just like a middle infielder who drops down sure. to make a base runner slide. Yep. Here's Ordonez, who in this case has got to get his throw up. 
and get it over Bernie Williams. He That's does right. It. That's a very, very good point, Joe. Because when you're dropping down, watch Odonius drop down to make Williams get down. Williams, inadvertently it appeared to me, throws up the left arm because that's the movement of the left arm when a guy's going straight into a base. I mean, if you think a guy is intentionally trying to get hit by a thrown ball when you're two feet away, that's a tough argument. I think the second base umpire made the right call. And the rest of the umpires backed him up on it. Yep. Bobby Valentine went to every one. It's a big play with Tino Martinez running. By the way, that could have injured Bernie Williams. Sure. But if Ordonez can't complain, if he's going to drop down to make a base runner get down and get out of his way, and he's got to be prepared if while the runner's getting down, he's got to get the throw over him. Right. Jorge Posada takes ball one low. One on, one out. So instead of two out, nobody on. A missed opportunity on a potential double play ball. Ball wasn't crushed, so it might have still been hard to turn two. But any chance was gone when Ordonez hit Williams with a throw. Posada pops it into left. There's the tough chance for McEwen, but he's there, two out. And the batter will be O'Neill. Total control so far for Kevin Apier. <laughs> Trying to get through the heart of the Yankee lineup. And the three guys that we came on the air talking about. Williams, Martinez, and Posada. Three big reasons why the Yankees have won 12 of their last 14 nine straight and have a game and a half lead in the AL East over Boston. Here is O'Neill who has 12 home runs on the season. Ball one. They do hold against Tino Martinez at first but not much of a chance for Martinez to run can't play behind him but Apier can focus on O'Neill with a count of one ball no strikes. Two balls no strikes and Pratt's going to go talk to Apier with Shane Spencer who has the Yankees only hit of the day on deck. Bobby Valentine has his outfielders in a no doubles defense with the thinking that if the Yankees are going to beat him or take the lead here in the seventh inning they're going to have to do it with two hits instead of one. That's the reason teams will play their outfield deeper than normally in a tie game or one run game in the late innings. Jay Payton very deep in center field but properly Two always hit in the air to left a base hit. And it's two on two out. A walk and hit in the inning only the second Yankee hit. But with that Shane Spencer will come to the plate with a chance to put the Yankees on top. It's like a quarterback taking that 10 or 12 yard pass in front of a prevent defense. Paul O'Neill taking the single. Obviously that's not the, the thinking there but. That's a broadcaster's rhyme right there. <laughs> it sounded good. He settled down into the hole of the zone defense. Yes. And gets a base in into the left center field for a two on two out situation for Shane Spencer. And the Yankee fans want to see the first run of the day. Spencer 12 RBIs on the season. Tried to hold up strike one. That's where everybody tries to pitch Shane Spencer. He is an inside hitter. You make a mistake to him inside. Dangerous. Now it's 0 2. 
Napier five strikeouts on the day. Brocious is on deck right now. It's up to Spencer to try to keep this inning alive. Got to wait for a mistake from Apier, who has not thrown many mistakes to the plate. And Shane just does stay alive. That's looking for anything to latch on to to feel good about a day's worth of baseball with a 37 and 50 record last place in the NL East. And they are getting a terrific effort out of Kevin Apier today. And a win here against the Yankees if they can pull that off but at least make their Saturday night pleasant as they head out into the city. No balls, two strikes on Spencer. Apier is allowed only two hits, three walks. Wants it up, way up. And another foul. Once Todd Pratt gave the signs he motioned with his mitt up up usually that means high Apier may have right there that means keep it up Apier may have shaken off location there he ends up throwing a fastball on the corner one thing that could have happened there was a meeting on the mound just before that Pratt yeah. might have said hey let's deke him I'll call for perhaps it he sees it you give it to me down yeah because Apier called Pratt out there if that's what indeed happened, then that's uh, categorize that in the area of thinking too much if you're a catcher or a pitcher. One and two on Spencer with two on, two out. Two and two. That's the one thing you don't want to give with a runner on at second base, and that's location. Todd Pratt giving the fastball after the sign and then slapping that left five. And sure enough, they came inside. Bobby Ballantyne wanted it, thinking to that at bat by Todd Zeal. Zeal's second at bat when he was called out on strikes. Ballantyne livid again. Somebody's going to call time. It's Spencer. A 21 pitch inning, 92 on the day. So even with 21 here in the seventh, he has kept the total down. And Pratt out to talk again. Valentine has walked four miles down in that dugout today. Hoping Apier can get Spencer to end the inning. He can. Delayed strike three call, and now Spencer gets in the face of the home plate umpire. It has been a rough day for young Andy. Saturday baseball, Chipper Jones and the Braves take on Manny Ramirez and the Red Sox as both teams try to keep pace in their tight division races. Then Thursday, Manny and the Red Sox return to take on the Mets. That's at Shea, a Thursday night baseball interleague showdown on Fox Family Thursday. Watch the entire baseball season unfold across the Fox networks. Jay Watasik is the new pitcher for the Yankees, a 6 and 2 record overall. And Watasik, a hard throwing right hander, the Yankees picked up from San Diego. Former Cardinal farmhand. He's been with the Royals. He has been with the Padres, and now he is here with the Yankees as they traded a pretty good infield prospect, D'Angelo Jimenez, to get him. Only thing that curtailed D'Angelo's progress through the Yankee farm system. He would have been a player with the Yankees last year but he broke his neck in the Dominican Republic a year and a half ago. 
and was on the mend last year, but he is a fine looking young hitter. McEwing slices one foul down the right side. Messina, seven innings, no runs, six hits, one walk, ten strikeouts. 119 pitches on the day. Mike Messina had the poorest run support in the American League last year. Only 3.71 runs per game. And he was third coming into this game. Breaking ball gets McEwing. And that's 11 times today the Mets have gone down on strikeouts. Good start for Watasi. Longest hitters will continue to go after sliders, breaking balls off the plate, continue to throw them. Here's Desi Relaford, who's one out of three. Relaford takes ball one. The toxic kind of a David Arquette. Scream look about him as he blows one past Relaford, one ball, one strike. Mariano Rivera sitting, watching, and resting out of the bullpen, and he's had a little more rest since the two acquisitions from the bullpen for the Yankees, not only with Tosic, but Mark Wollers. Mike Stanton on your left will head to the All Star game. As deserving as any middle reliever or setup reliever in the game. Two and two. And as valuable a Yankee as there is on this team. You bet in many ways. Said it a couple of weeks ago, in my view, prior to his All Star selection, and it will be his first All Star game on Tuesday night. Mike Stanton was the most underrated reliever in the game. And even with that selection, he may still be. Now people try to pick apart his season and say why he doesn't deserve to go. <laughs> Mike Stanton will join Paul Quantrill. Middle relievers, set up relievers. Quantrill, seven and two with an ERA of 2.2. The ERA for Stanton outstanding a ton of work. Oh the home plate umpire might have pulled a back muscle flinching on that three balls two strikes. Andy Fletcher has had an adventurous day watch his body language. Whoa. When they raise up like that they're fixing to punch you out. Three two pitch has popped up. And out of play. Do you see any David Arquette in scream with Watasic, especially with the the stash he's got growing now? A little bit. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I do. A little bit. Right. <laughs> one out, nobody on. Three balls, two strikes. And a one out walk. One on one out for the three and four hitters that means Alfonso and Piazza. Bad boy. Fell asleep for a moment so Alfonso takes his time getting into the batter's box. And Edgardo looking down at John Stearns the third base coach to see if the Mets put a play on here with a runner at first decent speed with Relaford and one out not a bad idea to put Relaford in motion particularly now with the count in Alfonso's favor one ball no strikes what did those signs say to you hit and run. Well, I don't know for sure, but I, it's a good time to do it right now. The Yankees thinking along those lines and a check on Relaford over at first. Well, if you have first and third, and that's the primary reason for the hit and run, first and third, and Piazza's batting, 
And first base isn't open, but second is. Runner going. Alfonso takes the pitch, and Relaford steals the base, and he's there with one out. Desi's eighth of the year. We don't know whether Alfonso missed the hit and run or if this was a straight steal, but Relaford with an excellent jump. Piazza or Posada upset, and now not a thought of pitching around Alfonso. Cossack will try to get him because he does not want to see Piazza up there with two on. Here's a 2 0. It's a 1. Anytime you have an injured back, and I don't care what you do for a living, it's always in the back of your mind. And for Alfonso, who's playing in his first week off the injured back, where they really didn't know exactly what was wrong with him, he is back in the lineup and you wonder if he is convinced that he is totally healthy or feeling for the ball runner stealing third got a terrific jump but Alfonso fouled it away in the count two and two one out a good time to do it Relaford stepping into the line great jump but Alfonso fouls it back and Gardo only one out of 15 since coming off the disabled list. You can tell by his swings he looks like he's feeling for the ball. It's not that free and easy cutting the bat loose. On two and two. Alfonso flies one into right center. O'Neill back to get it. Two out. Tagging going to third is Relaford, and he'll be there for Piazza. Alfonso gives it a ride, but it's not deep enough. And now with Piazza up there, you got to walk him. Even though the left-handed Mark Johnson's on deck. And that is the decision by the Yankees. Pretty clear right here. No way can Mike Piazza beat you with all the other Mets either injured, particularly Robin Ventura. And it will be up to Mark Johnson. There's also the chance, and I'm not saying it's going to happen here, and I'm not saying it should happen here, but in an American League city with a designated hitter, if you're trying to find a spot to use one of the best pinch hitters in the history of this game, Lenny Harris, now wouldn't be a bad time to use him. I'm not saying lift Johnson for Harris, but it's definitely got to be at least a consideration for a guy who's number three on the all time pinch hit list, but not even a thought, evidently, as Harris is just hanging out watching the game. And it's up to Mark Johnson, who today is one out of three with two strikeouts. Lenny kind of peeking down and seeing if Bobby Valentine is. To make a call, but nope, it'll be up to Johnson. It's certainly not a bad consideration. Though. So it's Johnson with a chance to put the Mets on top. Another reason why you, why you might want to keep him on the bench, however, is Ordonez lurking down at the bottom of the lineup. I say that because if he comes up with a chance to win it with a hit. There's no doubt he'll be lifted for the pinch hitter. And, and Bobby probably going under the theory that, hey, if you can start him, he can hit in a flex situation, as this certainly is. One ball, no strikes. First and third, two out. No score in the eighth. One and one. Two walks in the inning has produced this situation. First and third, Watasik trying to get Johnson to end the top of the eighth. One and two. Backdoor breaking ball freezes Johnson. Remember, Johnson, a very good low ball hitter, makes him vulnerable to the inside fastball. 
Watasik trying to keep it scoreless. Johnson. Two and two, and Watasik can get it up there in a hurry. The opposite way, Spencer going to it. And we're still scoreless. An unintentional walk, a stolen base. A intentional walk to Piazza, and Johnson could. The great views from above you're seeing of today's action are being brought to us today by Monster.com's East Coast Blimp, Trump. Monster.com, job good, life good. Defensive change for the Mets as Timo Perez comes in the game. He's in right field. Mark Johnson will leave frustrated. He had a chance to put the Mets on top and fly it out to left against Watasik. And we're still scoreless. Bottom of the eighth. Brocious, Soriano, and Knobloch for the Yankees against Apier. What a day for Kevin Apier. Ball one. Any sign of a rally? Look at the starters for the afternoon. Great work by both Messina and Apier. Any sign of start of a rally and Rivera will start loosening for the Yankees. That might fall in. Shallow center. That is caught. Dropped. Brocious to second. The throw. Got it. One away. That is a terrific play by Timo Perez, shadowing the play. And watch how quickly he gets to the ball when the ball tumbles out of Peyton's glove, barehanding it. That was Edgardo Alfonso, I beg your pardon, not Perez, the right fielder. That could have gone either way, just like the call at second base that the Mets had earlier on the. Stolen base attempt by McEwing. Terrific heads up play by Edgardo Alfonso. So a base hit, the put out 4 6. We showed the throw by Alfonso, the second baseman. And now with one out, nobody on, here's Soriano, who's 0 for 2. One ball, one strike. Scott Brocious running hard right from the get go and giving himself a chance to take the extra base. One ball, one strike, one out, nobody on. Two and one, the effort by Peyton. Coming up with it, and then as he Whirled around having it fall out of his glove. You could see Broch just hesitate. It's impossible, I would imagine. You've been out there mm -hmm. not to watch the play mm -hmm. as you're running the bases well, to see well, you if have it's a to. hit. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have to watch the play to determine whether you can take the chance to take the extra base. So the effort by Peyton, like it slowed Brocious just enough to get mm -hmm. the out at second. And Soriano has a 2 2 count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you make your turn at first base, you have to slow down and and have control speed and not full out speed to determine whether you should continue to second base. It's understandable. Soriano now with one out. Saw John Franco getting loose for the Mets. Two out. Soriano strikes out for the first time today, and that's seven strikeouts for Apu. We're going to try to show you the hesitation Joe referred to. Bush is looking at the ball, looking at the ball, and right here decides to turn it on. But if you're going too fast and not in control speed, then you're halfway. And then if you try to get back to first base, a center fielder or a second baseman can get pick up the ball and throw behind you. 
Here's Knobloch with the bases empty, two out. And a strike floats in from Apier. Knobloch 0 for 2 with a walk. The degree of turn around first base, the turn you make around first base, depends, everything goes from left field on. If it's in left field, you can go halfway. If it's in center field, less so. And in right field, your turn has to be short because the right fielder can throw behind you. Now block off the end of the bat. Peyton won't get to that. A two-out single. And now Jeter. Right off the end of the bat. Little flare for Knobloch. I just found out today that Knobloch in German is pronounced Knoblach, and it and it stands for garlic. Can you imagine Larry King going on German radio? Larry King for Knoblach. <laughs> you can, can't you? I, for some reason, I can. <laughs> Hello, Frankfurt. <laughs> Well, here's a spot to run. You've got Knobloch at first with 26 steals, Jeter at the plate, and Pratt behind the plate, who's thrown out only one out of 12 potential base stealers. The more behind in the count, Apier runs to Jeter, the more likely Knobloch is to take off. Not going as Jeter shoots it foul. We've got Jeter up. The switch hitter Bernie Williams on deck. Franco in the bullpen. This could very well be Apier's last batter one way or the other. Go ahead, run it first with two out here in the eighth inning of a scoreless game. Again, Pratt, one out of 12 in the stolen base department. Piazza, 16 out of 88. As a team, the Mets have thrown out only 17% of potential base deal. Oh, a strike call on the inside part to Jeter, and that makes a big difference in the running situation. Instead of two and one, it's one and two. Usually a catcher will not get a strike like that for a pitcher when he has to cross the plate. Andy Fletcher has shown to have or been shown to have a wide strike zone today. Knobloch's got a run right now, doesn't he? We'll keep an eye on him at first with two out. And he was leaning. He was leaning, and Apier threw over. Not block able to get back. You could see that little nudge with the right leg. Not block probably was going to throw over to first base. Almost has to run in this situation. Because of that, a pitch out that evens the count, and the Mets may have pitched out into even more of a running situation. Two balls, two strikes, one on, two out. Go ahead, run it first right now. Jeter with a 2 2 count, another throw over. Now, block 26 steals, another sign he may be running here. Rivera is starting to loosen in the bullpen. A 2 2 pitch. He's going. Jeter strikes out, and the inning's over. Great work by Kevin Apier. And this game, the Mets and Yankees, scoreless through eight. Ninth inning with Zeal, Peyton, and Pratt coming up. Peyton and Pratt. One and one from Watasek, who at one point in his younger days was traded 
for his pitching coach Mel Stottlemyre's son Todd. The deal between the A's and the Cardinals. Breaking ball has Zeal failing and it's one and two. That is a nasty breaking ball right there. When you think about the first eight innings of this ball game, you can't think of too many balls that have been hit hard, primarily because of pitches like that. Sliders on the black. Well, he made Zeal look bad. Oh. Second strikeout for Watasek. For a pitcher, nasty is good. This pitch from Watasek is good. <laughs> Here's Peyton now, 0 for 2 with a walk. Jay is flying to center, struck out, walked. That was his last time up. The Mets, by the way, are 1 for 8 with runners in scoring position today. 94 mile an hour fastball, ball one. And the one hit didn't produce a run, obviously, as it was Piazza running and a hit up the middle by Zeal. After a leadoff double did not produce the run. Peyton had the chance with first and third one out. But he flied into shallow center. That was way back in the second. So more of the same for the Mets. Peyton hitting 265. On the corner, two and one. The Yankees in the bottom of the ninth. Bernie Williams, Tino Martinez, Jorge Posada, the three, four, five hitters, and as Mike Shannon would say, old Abner has done it again. <laughs> Heart of the order in the bottom of the ninth for the scoreless game. Into right, O'Neill, two out. Mike Shannon, longtime voice with your dad, St. Louis Cardinals, for 32 years. My goodness. And talking about Abner, the great, 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 great uncle of Nelson Doubleday, who is now the part owner of the New York Mets. But that may not be the case in another month or two. He may sell his share to Fred Wilpon. Not official yet, but certainly more than a rumor here in New York. No time really has that been denied by Doubleday. Uh -uh. Franco still loosening. Stanton has been loosening for the Yankees, but Watasik's doing just fine as he's 0-2 on Pratt. This is the best Jay Watasik has thrown for the Yankees for the Yankees since arriving in New York two and a half weeks ago by far. A scoreless eighth. Two-thirds of the way through a scoreless ninth. One and two. Two and two. Ordonez next. Time for the bottom of the ninth inning. Three hours after we started. Part of the order. Will shut out innings against the Atlanta Braves. He won that game, was credited with the win, his fifth of the year. And today he shuts out the Yankees for the first eight innings. He's out of there and the heart of the Yankee order coming up. Franco will deal with Bernie Williams Tino Martinez and Jorge Posada two switch hitters in there. Both switch hitters are stronger power wise from the left side. Franco sometimes. Sometimes struggles against the left handed batter. Because it takes that change up, his best pitch away from him. That was it there. And it's rarely a strike. Rarely. Yankees wondering if they can string 10 wins together. One ball, no strikes. Two balls, no strikes. Bernie Williams has been known to take in situations like this when he should be hitting. Franco will challenge hitters. 
He'll throw the fastball right down the pipe to anybody. That was a changeup right there. Strike zone. Yankees on their longest winning streak since August of 98. An incredible year with 125 total wins through the World Series. Here's a 2 1 delivery. And it's 2 and 2. Franco following the changeup with a 2 1 fastball right there. When you're looking for that changeup and you get an 88 mile an hour fastball, it looks like it's 188 miles an hour. So it was 2 0, oh, now it's 2 and 2. Williams is gone, and a good start for Franco here in the ninth inning. Franco heavily courted by the Phillies during the offseason. Reportedly turned down bigger money to come back to Shea Stadium. Phillies in first place. The Mets 13 games behind Philadelphia. <laughs> if somebody's barking from the Yankee dugout. Franco with that uh, with that smile and shrug. Hey pal I've been in this position a lot of times trying to position the defense is Mookie Wilson as ball one misses low and away to Tino Martinez trying to get the left fielder Joe McEwing to move over toward the left center see if Franco can get the left handed batter Martinez has hit some big home runs lately for the Yankees as he takes ball two to an one thing uh, here at Yankee Stadium, I bet this might be the first time I've ever disagreed with Mookie Wilson, but I don't agree. I think what you have to do as a left fielder with a left handed batter up is play closer to the line because if you hit a ball to left center, it's going to tail back into the position. Here's a 2 0. Right down the middle, 2 1. Mets fans hoping they get a chance to walk out of this stadium with their chests puffed out proud of what their Mets did on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of a frustrating season. And if that is to happen it's going to take extra innings here today two balls two strikes on Tino Martinez with Jorge Posada on deck. If this game goes to the 10th. It'll be Ordonez McEwing and Relaford anybody gets on Alfonso for the Mets. In the next half inning. Martinez with 17 home runs. And a three ball two strike count. Here it is with one out. Tino Martinez pops it up into right. And that'll jump out of play. Going up to try to get one and drive it out of the park. It's still a full count. I think that's exactly what he was trying to do. Anything inside, I'm going to hop on, even though it was out of the strike zone, and try to end this baby. Bows it off. Again the 3 2 pitch to Tino Martinez pop foul back and out of play. Well if last night was a subdued night for crowd reactions especially after the three to nothing first inning lead and an 8 3 Yankee win. The ninth win for the Yankees in a row another loss for the Mets. Today has been back to normal in this series. 
tight game exciting well played as Martinez hits it in the air to left McEwing puts it away two down in fairness to Mookie Wilson Mookie moved McEwing toward left center field Joe would have made the catch anyway where he was playing because the ball is going to tail back to him but Tino Martinez hitting that ball just about where Mookie Wilson had moved Joe McEwing outfield defensive positioning is so important and the reason it's important is they have more ground to cover. Here is Posada. Last chance for the Yankees in regulation. A strike on the outside corner. An infielder can be a step or two uh, out of position. And if a ball gets by him, it's a single. If an outfielder is a step or two out of position, more than likely it'll be an extra base hit. Here's an 0 1. On deck, another left hander, Paul O'Neill. Posada has hit only two of his 13 home runs, batting right handed. John Franco would rather bite the head off a rattlesnake than throw. Posada, a fastball to hit here. Two out, nobody on, 1-1, one, one. Posada. Out in front, 1-2. and two. Jorge's going to see that pitch again. Why well, you talk about how effective he can be against right handed batters. Oh. Turning it over, running it down and away. Two out, bases empty, a ball and two strikes on Posada. Same pitch. Jorge laid off. It's two and two. Nothing, nothing in the ninth. Two out, nobody on. Posada takes ball three. After chasing one of those pitches, he's laid off two in a row. Mm -hmm. And in all probability, he'll get the same pitch again. Looks like Rivera is going to be the pitcher in the top of the tenth inning. If it goes that far. Three two just low a two out walk and John Franco is screaming at the home plate umpire Andy Fletcher here comes Bobby Valentine remember a manager cannot argue a ball or a strike Todd Pratt taking up for Franco Bobby saying Bobby or Bobby saying to John that uh, the game's more important. And Bobby's going to take the flack. If anybody gets run from this game, it's going to be Bobby Valentine, not John Franco. Valentine will likely wait out on the mound until the home plate umpire, Andy Fletcher, pays a visit. That's what's going to happen, and then we'll have another argument. And that way, he won't be accused of our ball and a strike. And here comes Andy. Nope. Bobby left. Now the glare. You give Valentine a little credit there. Yeah. For not waiting, and I'll give Fletcher credit on the call. That, that pitch, pitch was low. Was low. Yeah. But the home plate umpire, Andy Fletcher, delayed and then started to make that walk he didn't want to make, and Bobby Valentine at that instant turned and headed back to the dugout. Now it's Paul O'Neill with the potential winning run at first and two out. A scoreless game in the ninth inning. That's low, and Franco is really hot. His reaction after that pitch, he's looking in the dugout. 
And this is very, very unlike John Franco. Well, you know, Joe, in, in fairness, again, Franco rarely throws that pitch for a strike. So John can't expect that pitch to be called a strike when he doesn't throw it for a strike. That's not the design of the pitch. One ball, no strikes. Runner at first, two out. One and one. John throws fastballs for strikes and the changeup out of the strike zone, out of the strike zone low. Umpires are like hitters. They know what pitchers throw. And they're more inclined to call that changeup low. And then that 3 2 pitch was certainly low to walk Posada. One ball, one strike, one on, two out. O'Neill. One out of three on the day. Alfonso, this game's going to the tenth. John Franco does a nice job through the heart of the order. Talking to himself as he exits the field. Tenth inning at Yankee Stadium. Still no score. Biggest night. The summer's biggest event. In just three days, the 2001 All-Star Game. Only on Fox. Third-year umpire Andy Fletcher has, if nothing else, been patient. And he has been tested here today. Uh, he really has, as Mariana Rivera is in there. As a matter of fact, uh, John Franco giving that with his left hand, giving that low sign around the knees for gesturing like that. Some umpires would run a player for showing them up. If he were a more experienced umpire, you mentioned Fletcher in his third year, I think John would have been gone. Rivera, as you might expect, marvelous numbers. There's John Franco. More time saying is that was low? 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 Yeah, low. It was low. It was low, John. Here's Ray Ordonez. Here's Mariano Rivera. And there's a fastball poured over the inside part for ball one. Ordonez, 0 for 3. Grounded out, reached on an error, and fouled out. A 1 0 to the left side and easy for Brocious. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Have you ever seen the word disseminated any place else other than that? No. Disclaimer, nor have I. I <laughs> assume that the word exists. <laughs> Ball inside to Joe McEwen. McEwing is one hit, four at bats, three strikeouts surrounding the one hit. That's off the hands, one and one. Three days till the All Star game. Tuesday night in Seattle. Armando Benitez, Turk Wendell, two right handers getting loose for the Mets in their bullpen. I'll tell you the Franco. It's likely finished. That's out of play off the bat of McEwing. One and two. Is it fair to say that Mariana Rivera predominantly throws one pitch? Yeah. The one little uh, twist that it, uh, Mariano has added this year is a an intentional inside slider to a right-handed batter. You'll see Posada occasionally give the slider sign or the cut fastball sign and set up inside. Here it comes right here. That was it. And a jam shot foul down the first baseline. Most cutters from a right-handed pitcher go away from a right-handed batter. But because of that, to prevent them from going outside, Posada sets up inside, and Rivera starts it more on the inside, off the inside part of the plate. So it actually jams the right-handed batter. That's been his little twist to his stuff this year. 
but for the most part it's the same speed. One and two on McEwing with Relaford on deck. Chasing it and heading back to the dugout with his fourth strike out of the day is Joe McEwing. Mariana Rivera weighs 170 pounds and huffs and puffs very little. You'd be you'd be surprised at how loosely Rivera holds his pitches and generally speaking the looser you hold the ball the harder you throw it. Here's Relaford. Desi one out of three had a dramatic home run a couple of Saturdays ago against the Atlanta Braves to tie the game in the ninth inning a game the Mets eventually lost by a final of nine to three and on the year Relaford has hit four home runs. Oh, and won the count with two out, nobody on. Relaford shoots one the other way, and the top of the tenth inning continues. Good work by Relaford because now it brings up Alfonso with the protection of Mike Piazza hitting behind him on deck. It says Mariana Rivera has come into the American League. Most of the hits that are gotten off of Mariano, they may not break the bat, but they're off the fat part of the bat. And if Relaford ran the last time he was on first, he is certainly going sometime in the first three or four pitches. Alfonso at the plate 0 for 4 1 out of 16. He's coming off the disabled list on Tuesday. That was a disappointing series for the Mets at home against the Cubs. The Cubs taking two of three. Cubs winning again last night. Cubs bringing a four game lead into today's action over Houston. The Astros are getting hot. Good young pitching for Houston. One on, two out. Alfonso takes a ball. The last time the Cubs won the World Championship was nine years before the Bolshevik Revolution. Haley's Comet has passed by Earth twice. We've gone through this. <laughs> well, I thought I'd throw the revolution thing in there since we it's about the only thing we haven't prepared it with. Here's a strike. One ball, one strike. You see that little line right there? That is what they have across the uh, from the ballpark in Chicago, across the street, AC 12. That means 12 years ago, the last time they were in postseason play. 56 years ago, before they had a World Series appearance, and, or since they had one. And 93 years ago was their last World's Championship. Two balls and a strike. Piazza waits on deck. Edgardo Alfonso nine home runs on the year. The count in his favor two and one. We'll see if Relaford takes off. He's going. The pitch is a strike. The throw to second too late. And Desi just able to keep his foot on the bag. Now a hit could give the Mets the lead as Relaford steals his second base of the day. If Rivera is tough to hit he's tough to catch too. And Posada, even though uh, uh, Rivera throws the ball hard and gets it to a catcher, he throws high strikes. But it's tough to center his ball, whether you're hitting it or catching it. And if it's tough to center, it's tough to throw. Relaford easily in there with the stolen base. Now a hit could put the Mets on top. The 2-2 two -two pitch to Alfonso. Still 2-2, two and, two, and you can just see by the way he's yep. walking. Yep. Yep. He is not 100 percent healthy feeling for the ball in the strike zone and that's usually a sign that uh, a hitter is in pain and understandably Edgardo with that bad lower back. It's a bad guy to face with a bad back. <laughs>
Down on a knee, two balls, two strikes. That back is bothering. Alfonso with a go ahead run at second base and two out in a scoreless game, 10th inning. Full count with Piazza waiting on deck. Relaford at second with two out, and it's up to Piazza. A hit, a stolen base, a walk. Franco wondering if he might be in line for a win. That would be the case if Piazza comes through here in the 10th inning. A double in his first at bat. He homered here last night. This is his second game back from the broken left big toe. He suffered a week ago Friday in Atlanta. Same matchup. The final out of the 2000 World Series. Didn't get it all. Williams hauled it in in center. And the Yankees had won their third straight world championship. Talk about great theater. They're doing things they don't do on Broadway here at Yankee Stadium. And now Jeter comes in to talk to Rivera. Piazza. A double, an intentional walk, two strikeouts. Now facing Rivera with two on, two out in a scoreless game. And taking a strike. During the regular season in his career against Rivera, Piazza's 0 for 2, and Mel Stottlemyre will come out and talk to Rivera with two on, two out, and I'll ask you what this conversation I, could be about. I, I was going to say, Joe, it's very odd. Mel Stottlemyre motioning to both Soriano and Jeter, and I think what Mel is telling them, let him run. If he wants to run, we have a place for Piazza. And now Andy Fletcher's making a quick trip to the mound. And Mel Stottlemyre, by bringing the middle infielders in, you're saying, forget about the runner at second base. Play straight up in your position. If Relaford wants to take third base with Piazza hitting and, Fia and Alfonso wants to steal second, we have a place for Piazza. Sound reasoning. Two on, two out. One ball, one strike. This season compared to his career, the average with runners in scoring position. Both middle infielders are spread with Relaford at second base. Piazza with a base hit into right field. The Mets will take the lead. Mike Piazza, bad toe and all, delivers in the 10th. Piazza doubling to right center his first time up and watch how he fights off this inside fastball. Joe we talked about it with the first right hander of the inning that was Ordonez. By design. That inside cutter and John Franco with every reason. To stand up and cheer. Perez tries to fight one off the other way. And add another broken bat to the pile. Outside Yankee Stadium. 
First at bat for Timo since taking over in the eighth inning defensively out and right for Mark Johnson. Talked about Mike Piazza at the beginning of the game. Now he has stated publicly that he is going to make every effort to get to the All Star game. You talk about the consummate gamer in this game, and that's that guy you're looking at right there, number 31. This guy trying to add to the one to nothing Mets lead. First and third, two out. Perez takes ball one. Wendell can sit down in the Mets bullpen now. Benitez will focus on getting ready for the bottom of the 10th. What will the lead be? Perez gets a base hit. Two nothing Mets. time the Mets have had to smile in a few days they lost the last game of the Cubs series that you talked about Joe 12 to 4 they lose a tough game last night and something finally to celebrate finally two hits for the Mets with runners in scoring position now zeal takes a strike on the outside corner both hitters not trying to do too much going the opposite way first Piazza to right and then the left hander Perez in the left three hits a walk all of this with two out as Zeal gets a base hit up the middle they're going to bring Piazza to the plate Bernie Williams with a throw back into second it's three nothing Mets. that they're doing it off Rivera considered in past years as invincible as zeal rifles one to the right of Soriano Piazza has shown on a couple of occasions today that he's not running poorly at all no and for him that's Without a limp and getting around the bases pretty well. First and third, two out, and Peyton checked his swing, ball one. And I questioned uh, Mike thinking that he could catch tomorrow night, but after seeing him run this afternoon, I think it's a distinct possibility that catching tomorrow night and ultimately the All-Star game in Tuesday and two on Tuesday, a distinct possibility. That seems to be Piazza's barometer yeah. as to whether he's going to head to Seattle. Peyton up the middle, Rivera stabs it, and a long top of the tenth inning is history. What a game! What a feeling for the Mets, and who started it? At least for the RBIs, Piazza. Back after this from your local Fox station. Today, Mariano took over in the tenth inning, and without a doubt, the feat of the day. Brought to you by Lotriman as Armando Benitez takes over. Now it's the Mets closer's turn and the feet of the day. Looks like this. The base hit the opposite way by Piazza against Rivera for the first run. Two more hits followed. The rally entirely accomplished with two outs. A hit by Relaford, a walk to Alfonso, a hit by Piazza, a hit by Perez, a hit by Zeal. And after struggling for the last eight games with runners in scoring position, the tenth inning was kind to the Mets as they came through against one of the best relievers, one of the best pitchers in the game today. Shane Spencer first up, one ball, one strike. And now one and two is Benitez. 
tries to do what Rivera couldn't do, and that is pitch a scoreless tenth. Also, Joe, that stolen base unsettled things for Mariana Rivera. The two out base hit by Relaford, and then the stolen base. Now things became dangerous for the Yankees. Now you take care in pitching to Alfonso, and Piazza delivers. It was a walk to Alfonso that brought Piazza to the plate. The Mets on a couple of pitches before the hit, Tim, and you pointed it out, had the chance to take second and third if they started the runners. Right. But that leaves first base open. Mm -hmm. They stayed put. They left it up to their big guy, and Piazza delivered. Now Spencer flies one into center, and Peyton goes to get it one away. One out here in the tenth inning. Bottom half for the Yankees. <laughs> So Rivera who has been automatic for years here and you can go back to 96 when the question was whether Rivera as a setup or middle reliever should have been added to the all star roster springs a leak in the 10th inning today Brocious with one out to the left side for Relaford a big part of the day for the Mets takes care of Brocious two out. And the Yankees down to their final out here in the 10th inning. Soriano now walks to the plate. Bobby Valentine could have easily have made the case for Benitez to go to the All-Star game. He said he knows he's my All-Star, but he felt others deserve to go. A guy who has a legitimate beef is Rob Nen of San Francisco, who's not a part of the team. Might be the best reliever in the National League. Benitez misses high with ball one. Soriano 0 for 3 on the day. Just outstanding pitching by the Mets. Apier, Franco, Benitez. One and one. The producer of today's game is Jeff Gowan, the director Bill Webb, the associate director Aaron Stoikov, the broadcast associate Eric Billigmeyer, Steve Horn here in the booth. Here's a 1 1 pitch. Soriano flies it to right. Perez over to get it. And that'll do it. A win for the Mets. Only their 38th win of the year, but this one feels better than the first 37. It's because it was against the world champion New York Yankees. A little payback time at Yankee Stadium for the Mets today. They came from behind with a big eighth inning a couple of Sundays ago at Shea. But it has to feel even better to do it today in Yankee Stadium against one of the best in the business, Mariano Rivera. That'll do it for us from Yankee Stadium. When we next talk to you, it'll be on Tuesday night from Seattle. The 72nd All-Star Game. We hope you join us then. For more information on today's game and for the latest information on Major League Baseball, go to FoxSports.com. For Tim McCarver, I'm Joe Buck. So long from New York. Right now, Jeannie Zelasco and Kevin Kennedy in the Fox Television Center. From all of us at Yankee Stadium, until Tuesday night from Seattle, so long.